Well, hello and welcome to Church Online. I'm Chris, I'm the pastor here at Movement Church. We're so glad and honored that you would make the decision to be here at this time of the year, be here at, 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 whether it's on a Sunday as we go live or whether it's in the middle of the week as you catch up with, with church. We're just so glad that you would make the decision to take some time out of your day, out of your week, to spend some time in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, spend some time in worship and prayer with us. We're so grateful. Uh, today we're in part two of our series, Wonderful, talking about the Christmas story and talking about the awe and the wonder that, of, of what God did with the birth of Jesus. And so uh, whatever for whatever reason you're here today, whether it's someone shared it to you and you just happen to be watching, you had nothing going better. Uh, maybe you're watching church before you dive into the NFL games that are going to be on later today. I'm so glad that you're here because today we're going to talk about the promises of God that were fulfilled through Jesus. And maybe there's some promises that you feel uh, have yet to be fulfilled in your life. And today there's some really good news for you as we dive right in. So here's the thing. If, if you're part of our church online family, I would love for you to share this because we feel like this could be really helpful for someone who's trying to take a step toward Jesus, or maybe they're not even trying, but man, you're hoping that they will. And so we'd love for you to share this, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on YouTube. I'd love you to sh share the link with someone, but we're going to dive right in today to part two of our series, Wonderful. Well, last week we began this series wonderful, this Christmas series wonderful by saying this, what God began with the birth of Jesus should fill us with a sense of awe and wonder at the greatness of God. That what God began with the birth and the arrival of Jesus, it should fill us with a sense of awe and wonder at how good our God is. That what God did should leave us with, with this sense of awe and wide-eyed wonder going, man, check out the amazing thing that God has Done. That even though this Christmas season you won't hear anything you haven't heard before in the Christmas story, we can still all be filled with awe and wonder because what God began then and there is still reaching our hearts and our lives here and now. And last week we began by looking at the good news of Christmas that should fill us with awe and wonder. Good news, a Savior has been born. You don't have to wait for Him one more moment. That good news, a Savior has been born to you and for you. He is far more personal than we would ever dream or hope of. And good news, you yes you can find him he is not too hard to find or too distant to find now today as we begin the new content i want to talk about a big word and some words that go right along with that big word and the big word is fulfilled would you matter of fact wherever you are right now would you either type in the chat or would you say out loud with me on the count of three ready one two three fulfilled here's a question for you have you ever made a plan or a promise around the holidays that you weren't able to fulfill Maybe, maybe it was the plan of what you were going to give someone as a gift, and then because of life circumstances, the money just wasn't there. Or, or maybe for some of you, it was a promise that you'd have the house decorated or the Christmas lights on the house or the gifts wrapped and under the tree by a certain point in time, and whatever deadline it was, it came and went, and you didn't come close to meeting your plan. Or maybe it was plans that you and your family had made to travel to be with loved ones around the holidays, and then either because of weather or sickness, you weren't able to turn those plans into reality. I, I know the last one was part of our life in Christmas season two years ago. But two years ago is the year 2020, and we had big plans of going to Wisconsin to be with my family for Christmas for the first time in our, in Jalen and I married life, the first time with our kids. It would have been the first time I was with my family for Christmas in 14 years. And then we got COVID the day before we were supposed to leave. And in my sadness and frustration with having to cancel those plans, we did still have one silver lining. With COVID, having COVID, we had not lost our sense of taste or smell. It was, it, it was the silver lining to having COVID at that point. And so while we were going to be isolated with just our family, I was going to prepare a great meal for us to enjoy as a family. I got a roast delivered and left at our door, got the potatoes and carrots and onions and celery, and we were going to make the most of Christmas and still have a wonderful Christmas meal. It started cooking, and I was so excited because it smelled really, really good. And then about a half an hour before we planned on eating, something funny happened. I couldn't smell the roast cooking anymore. Do you see where this is leading? Yeah, about an hour before dinner, the whole family lost our sense of taste and smell. It was the absolute, it was the icing on the cake of plans and promises that were not fulfilled for our family at Christmas 2020. So here's what we all know. There is nothing worse than unfulfilled promises and incomplete plans at Christmas. There's, there's nothing worse than unfulfilled promises at Christmas and, un, and incomplete plans 
at Christmas. Again, whether that's wrapping the gifts, whether that's being able to get the gifts that you want, whether it's travel, whether it's the food, whether it's whatever it is that you thought you were going to have and that you were going to do and that you and the people that you were going to see and not being able to see them and not being able to back up your promises, there is nothing worse than that at Christmas. Isn't that true? I mean, there's nothing worse. No worse feeling than knowing what you had planned or promised you just weren't able to make happen. And that's a tough feeling any time of the year, but especially at Christmas, that's a difficult feeling to process and to deal with. But it's also the reality of life, right? That at times we make promises and because of the circumstances outside of our control or because of things that are inside of our control, we aren't able to fulfill our promises. We make plans, but then things that, because of things outside of our control, we aren't able to do everything that we planned and promised to do. And in that line of thinking and with that thought in our minds, we actually find out something amazing about God and about what really happened at Christmas when Jesus was born. Because with the birth of Christ, here's what we see and here's what we come to understand. God never made a promise about the Savior that was not fulfilled through Jesus. God never made a promise about the Savior that was not fulfilled through Jesus. Everything that God had promised about the arrival and the life of the Messiah came to be in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Every single thing. There was nothing that the prophets foretold that did not come to be reality. There was no promise made from the very beginning that did not come to pass in the arrival and the life and the ministry and the death and resurrection of Jesus. This actually tracks with something that we're told early on in the Christmas story from the lips of the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary as he told her that she would conceive. She had a question. She had a question. Well, how is this going to be because I'm a virgin, because I'm not married, because I've never been with a man? And we're told this in Luke chapter. Chapter 1, verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Now, he's saying, look, God said that this was going to happen for your cousin. God's saying this is going to happen for you. And then he drops this line in verse 37 that is so powerful and so amazing and so at the center of what we're talking about today. He says this, For no word from God will ever fail. For no word from God, no promise of God, no plan that God has put into practice and put into motion, no preparation that God has done and, and spoken, no promise of God will ever fail. Now, what's so interesting about this is, 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 is as, as we talk about this, that no promise that was ever made wasn't fulfilled through the life of Jesus. Let me give you a few examples of some of these prophecies and promises that were fulfilled through Jesus' birth and some mind-blowing math. And this is actually some really cool apologetics here. The Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Zechariah, and Jeremiah, on two different occasions, uh, prophesied about the Messiah, each time calling the Messiah the branch. Now, the Hebrew word from branch is actually the word netzer. And what makes that so fun and so interesting in this conversation is that Jesus' hometown is a little place that we would know as Nazareth. Now, let me ask you this. Do you see any of the same letters in netzer and in Nazareth? You should. Because in Hebrew, Nazareth is the same word netzer. So Jesus of Nazareth is very literally Jesus the branch. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, they all talked about the Messiah as the branch. And then Jesus comes from Nazareth as Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Netzer, Jesus the branch. That's fun in and of itself. Like if, if, if that isn't enough, let's go a little bit further. From Matthew, in his gospel, Matthew explains five Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled from his perspective in the birth of Jesus. There's five, okay? Depending on which accounts you pay attention to, there's anything anywhere between eight and 22 separate prophecies that were, were fulfilled in the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding his birth. By my count, I I get 11, so, but, but eight is the low number, okay? A number of years ago, someone did a math, mathematical calculation trying to determine the likelihood or the odds of one person fulfilling eight Old Testament prophecies. The number that they came up with is, is just astronomical odds. It's one in 100 quadrillion. That's after trillion. It's one in 100 quadrillion. I mean, just absolute mind-boggling numbers. And that's just the birth of Jesus. When you look to the day that Jesus was crucified, that day alone, 
he fulfilled 27 prophecies in a single day. From birth to crucifixion, he fulfilled at least 351 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Again, the same person attempted to figure out what the odds of one person doing that were. They stopped when they got to the math of fulfilling 48 Old Testament prophecies because the numbers were just getting, getting absurd at that point. The chances of one person fulfilling 48 prophecies is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. I, get, I mean, like, I can't even put that on the screen right now. It's just astronomical odds of one seventh of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his lifetime. Now, here's the thing. At, at, at this point, you might be asking like, well, why does it matter that Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies in the way that he was born and lived and died? And it's a great question and it has an even bigger answer. Here's the answer. This is why it matters so much that God keeps his promises and that just Jesus fulfilled so many promises and prophecies from the Old Testament. From beginning to end, God keeps his promises. From beginning to end, from every promise that God makes from the beginning until the time of Jesus, from beginning to end, God kept his promises. And from beginning to end of our lives and our experiences, our experiences in Christmas, our experiences in life and family and career and everything that we do, from beginning to end, God keeps his promises. He always has and he always will. There is no detail too small for his attention. Some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, they go like they're, they're tiny, minute things that when you look at them, you go, that doesn't matter. But because God promised it, God fulfilled it. There is no detail too small for his attention and there is no expanse too large for his power. Again, when you look at some of these, you go like, the chance of that happening to anybody it's, un, it's like, it's unbelievable chance that that would happen to anyone. And they happen to Jesus because there's no expanse that is too large for God's power. And here's the amazing thing that we, that we get from that. God cares about the smallest details of your life and is capable of moving the biggest mountains in your life. This is why this matters so much. God cares about the smallest details of your life. He cares about how you raise your kids. He cares about how you handle your finances. He cares about how you about how you handle every relationship in your life. He cares about what you do on your lunch hour. He cares about the smallest details of your life. What you say to your husband, what you say to your wife, what you say to your kids, how you treat the people around you, how you treat your neighbors. Every interaction of your life, God cares about it. He cares about the smallest details of your life. And at the same time, he is capable of moving the biggest mountains in your life. The things that you look at and go, there's no way that God could ever do it because where I am for where I feel like I'm supposed to be, that's just too big of a thing. And there is no such thing as too big of a thing for God. For no word from God will ever fail. For no word from God has ever failed. He's that good. He is that strong. And I love during the Christmas season to draw our attention to this because in the Christmas story or in, in the events immediately after the birth of Jesus, the way God shows us his ability to fulfill his promises and plans in the mundane and in the deeply unique and personal and in huge global ways. Let's begin in Luke chapter two today, starting after Jesus was born, after the wise men and shepherds have come to see Jesus. In verse 21, we're told this, when the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when, the and when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, this is important for us to understand in the context of talking about God's promises and God's God's purposes and God's plans and everything that God had planned and everything that God promised, everything that God was prophesied, everything that was going to happen through Jesus. Here's something that's important to understand. Jesus didn't just fulfill God's promises. He fulfilled God's plan. Jesus didn't just fulfill God's promises. He fulfilled God's plan. Meaning everything that Jesus did from beginning to the end was according to the plan that God had ordained and revealed to him and for him. 
His obedience, in other words, his obedience didn't begin in the Garden of Gethsemane. His obedience didn't begin at the cross. It began as an infant. It was a family thing. In his circumcision, in his naming, in the dedication as a, as a child, and sacrificial offerings being made by Jesus' parents, Jesus fulfilled and completed every step of God's plan and God's law from the beginning. He didn't just fulfill God's promises. He also fulfilled God's plan. And here's why this matters and why we should pay attention to this. God doesn't skip steps in his plan in order to fulfill his promises. God had his perfect son dedicated to the Lord because that's what was required in the religious law. God had his perfect son circumcised because that's what was required by the law. God had Jesus do everything that was required of humanity under the law so that he could be a perfect and sinless sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. God paid attention to every detail and Jesus completed every step. Jesus did not just complete and fulfill God's promises, although that's amazing. That's like, wow. But Jesus also fulfilled every step of God's plan along the way, because God does not skip steps as he fulfills his plans and his promises and his purposes. Now we're told this in verse 25. As they're on that trip, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Now, again, imagine receiving that promise. Imagine being, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and being told, you will not die before you see the Lord's Messiah. You will see the Savior of the world in your lifetime. With your eyes, you will see the Savior of the world. Now, you might die as soon as you see him. You, might die, like, you may literally evaporate into dust the second you see him. But, this, but you will, in your lifetime, with your own eyes, see the Savior of the world. Verse 27 tells us this. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, now this strange man just comes and takes, takes this child. He took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people, Israel. And I love this truth that we see here. God, in this moment, God fulfilled every part of his master plan, and God fulfilled every individual promise. I mean, again, in this moment, whether or not God fulfilled his promise to Simeon, does that ultimately... like? If Jesus was the savior of the world who came into the world and he died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead to invite us into new life and he was sinless every step along the way, would it have mattered if God had really just not fulfilled that promise to Simeon? It probably honestly would not matter except that we wouldn't know that God fulfills every single promise. This obscure, never recorded until Luke recorded it promise, God had made it, and because he made it, he would fulfill it. Ironically, this promise didn't matter to anyone else besides Simeon. Like, I mean, like we're not told that anyone else knew it besides Simeon, except that it's recorded in the book of Luke. It wouldn't have mattered to the story if God had not fulfilled the promise, but it matters because when God makes a promise, a really big one to the whole world or the whole nation or a tiny insignificant one to a single old man, God keeps his promises from start to finish, from beginning to end, the big ones to the small ones, the ones to everyone and the ones to a single one. God keeps his promise, which means if God made a promise to you, God will fulfill that promise and will see it through because God keeps his promises. 
Verse 33 then tells us this. His father and mother were amazed. There's that same Greek word we talked about last week, thamazo. They were amazed. They were in awe and wonder at what was being said about him. Mary, who had had an angel visit him. Mary, who had seen, I mean, like, who had literally seen an angel. Mary, who had shepherds and wise men arrive at the birthplace of this baby boy. Mary hears this man say, I I was told that I wouldn't die until I see the Savior of the world. They're amazed at what was being said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword that will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. God fulfilled the master plan. God fulfilled the individual promises. And then God was about to do one more thing in this very moment. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. I mean, at minimum, we know she's at least 91, but she's 91 if she got married as a baby and I'm against baby marriage, okay? She's at least 91. She's probably at least 100, maybe 105, maybe 115 years old. She did not leave the temple serving God day, night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And here's why I love this so much. So God fulfills his promises on a global scale. On a, the things that were prophesied about the Messiah in the Old Testament, all of them fulfilled through Jesus. The promise that was only made to Simeon, to one single person, God fulfills in that moment. And then God does something in this story that I think is just so beautiful. God went above and beyond his promises to display his goodness to the faithful. I mean, this wasn't even a promise. We're not told that there was any promise to Anna that she would see the the savior of the world before before she passed away. There was no promise that she would see the Messiah. There was no, before you die, you're gonna see him too and you're holding on to life as long as it takes until the savior of the world gets here, until God gets him into the world. There was no promise about this. This wasn't even a promise. This was just something that God in his goodness, decided to do for someone who had dedicated her life to serving God and serving others. This is above expectation, beyond promise behavior that is unexpected good that comes from God. So God, through Jesus, Through Jesus, we see that God keeps every promise he's ever made to the whole world. He also keeps every promise he's ever made to any any single person. And he also goes above and beyond his promises to show his goodness to those who love him, to those who are called and dedicated to his plans and to his purpose. And here's why this ultimately matters so much. Jesus is trustworthy and he is hope-worthy. That, that he is trustworthy because God keeps his promises. That God is trustworthy. God is hope-worthy because God always fulfills his promises. That word fulfilled, it, we, 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 we talked about it from the very beginning. There's nothing worse than, uh, than, than plans that are incomplete. There's nothing worse that pro- than promises that are unfulfilled. And the good news of Christmas is that God has no unfulfilled promises and he has no incomplete plans. And because he has no unfulfilled promises and because he has no incomplete plans, he is trustworthy and because of the goodness that we see displayed in, to, the, to these people and to, these, and to the people in the temple, we know he's also hope worthy. He's worthy of our trust and he's worthy of our hope. Let me talk just for a minute about him being worthy of our trust. He can be counted on to do everything that he has promised to do and to be everything that he has promised to be. He has promised to be with us. You can count on him that because he has promised to be with us, he will be with us. That even when he's promised, he will never leave us or forsake us. We can count on him to do just that. That when God says, I have a future for you, we can count on that God has a future for 
us, with whatever God has promised to us in his word, we can count on that God will do that. When God has said, here's who I am and here's who I will be, we can count on God to be that because no word from God has ever or will ever fail. God can be trusted with everything of your life. He can be trusted. You can trust his way in your marriage. You can trust his way in your career. You can trust his way with your kids. You can trust his way with your finances. No word from God will ever fail. And because of that, you can trust him. You can lean your life on everything that he has claimed to be and everything that he has promised to do. And you can know that you are in good, secure hands because no word from God will ever fail. God keeps his promises so he can be trusted to keep his promises and to be who he has promised to be. And then beyond that, there's this idea that he is worthy of our hope. He's worthy of our hope, that he's the one that we can look to with certainty in his goodness and his strength, his ability, his love for us and his ability on our behalf knowing that there is nothing beyond his power or ability and no good beyond his good. And so there are things in our lives where we may go, you know what, God, you haven't specifically addressed this or promised this in your word, but I'm gonna look to you with hope. I'm not looking to you with trust on this because you haven't addressed it, but I'm clinging to your goodness. I'm clinging to your character. I'm clinging to your strength. And this mountain in my life, this may be insignificant to anyone else thing in my life, this thing in my life that I have reached the end of me and my own ability to do it, I can look to you with hope knowing that you can and just maybe because of your goodness, you will. That because of your strength, I know you can because there is nothing that's beyond you, nothing too big for you. And in your goodness, I can hope that you will. In Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 25, we're told this. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what, what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We wait for it patiently. And that's the key to patience. That's the, when, when, when it's a trust thing, we go, God, this is what you've promised. This is who you promised to be. So I need you to do this. I need, you, like, I need you to live up to your word. When it comes to hope, we wait for it differently. We, we wait for it patiently. Going, God, it's in your timing. If, it's, if you're going to do it, it's in your timing. If you're going to do it, it's in your strength. If you're going to do it, it's in your will and in your way. So God, if you're going to do it, I leave it up to you completely and I'll wait patiently and I'll pray for it like crazy and I'll still do everything I can in my responsibility to try to make it happen. But if it's gonna happen, I believe for it from you and I'll wait patiently for it. So here's the question. What is it that you're hoping for? What is it that you're hoping for? What is it that you can't see but you believe for anyway? Maybe it's the salvation of a loved one. Maybe it's a person at work or or a part of your family, a, a, a member of your family that you've been praying they would come to know Jesus for a long, long, long time. Maybe it's, maybe it's that you don't see how it's going to happen, but you believe that your fam- family's future is not going to be what your family's past has been. That the family that you will build will be different than the family that you came from. You don't know how it's going to happen, but you're believing God for it. Maybe it's just that, that you're going, you know what? I, 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 I've, I've been sick. I've been sick. I've been sick. My body has kind of given up on me and it seems like things keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse, but I know God is a healer. And so I believe that God may just heal me and restore my body. I don't know what it is, but what is it that you see? You can't see with your physical eyes, but you see with your heart. You see with your imagination. You dream could be true. And would you continue to bring that to God in his goodness and in his strength? What is possible for you only if God goes to work on your behalf? You've gone to see all the doctors and they don't really have any answers. But God is the great physician. And so he can go to work on your behalf where every doctor has failed to give you answers. What is it that like if in your in, like as you try to change your family's financial future? As you go, God, I don't know like where, where I come from, we don't have the discipline to make this happen. We don't have the self-control to stop. So like, we don't like when we get money, everything goes through our fingers. So God, only if you get a control of my heart and mind and change me that's where it becomes possible to change the future of our family when it comes to our finances or when it comes to anything. Like at the end of the day, what is possible for you only if God goes to work 
on your behalf. You've already tried every, every way you can think of. You've invited people to every service imaginable. You've shared all this stuff on Facebook. You've worn Christian t-shirts. You've invited them to a Christian concert. You invited them to a Christian coffee shop. I don't even know what that is. I don't know if it's like coffee that's saved. But like, you, like you, you've done all of that and they haven't moved one step closer to Jesus, but it can happen in an instant if God goes to work on your behalf. He is worthy of our hope. And here's the beautiful truth as we close this message out. You can lean the weight of your life on what God has promised and on who he is. If you want to know what we learn from the Christmas story and from the days and the week that follow after, you can lean the weight of your life on what God has promised and on who he is. You can point your trust at him, trusting that he will do everything that he has promised to do and that he will be everything that he has promised to be. And you can point your hope at him knowing who he is, that he is the strong God, that he is the great physician, that he is the healer, that he is our provider, that he is our strength, that he is our redeemer, that he is our restorer. You know who he is. And so you can place your hope in him knowing that he, in his goodness, he just might do something beyond his promises. You can lean, and I can lean, and every single one of us, we can lean the weight of our life on what God has promised and on who he is. And in the middle of the Christmas season, isn't that good news that fills us with awe and wonder that the promises of God have never and will never fail? And for some of you, it's possible that you have felt like you received a promise from God and it has not happened yet. And today, I just want to encourage you, don't stop believing in the promises of God because no word from God has ever or will ever fail because God keeps his promise. And for some of you, you have a mountain that is in the middle of your life. And for you, it, it may not be a mountain for everyone, but it's a mountain for you. And if you think it's too big, you think it's too big and you think that it's something that man, like if, if God was going to do it, he would have done it by now. You patiently hope and you point your hope at Jesus, and you point your hope at your, at your heavenly Father, because God is worthy of the weight of your life. He's worthy of our trust, and he's worthy of our hope. And in the middle of the Christmas story, God stopped to remind us that he is good, that he is faithful, and that he fulfills every promise, and every plan, and every purpose. And in his goodness, he even goes above and beyond. And that is wonderful. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness to your word, to your promises, and to us. God, thank you that we can know you because of what you did through Jesus on the uh, uh, Jesus's birth, through his life, through the cross, through the empty grave. Thank you for every bit of it. Thank you for everything that you are and everything that you've done. And thank you that you keep your promises. Thank you that we can trust in you because you keep your promises. Thank you that we can hope in you because we know you go beyond your promises. And God, today, I just simply pray for anyone who's, who's on the fence thinking about giving up on a promise that has come from you. I pray that we would have the endurance to keep believing, to never stop believing that what you have promised, you will fulfill because you always fulfill your promises. And God, for those of us who are hoping for something from you, God, I simply pray today that you would meet us in the place of our hope. God, in the moments that go beyond what you've promised, that in your goodness and your mercy and your strength and your ability, you would meet us in our hope. And we would see you move on our behalf. So God, do that. Fulfill your promises. Fulfill your character. Show up to be who you have always been and to do what you have always claimed to do. Show us your love. Show us your mercy. Show us your strength as you fulfill your promises and as you fulfill your character that you go above and beyond your promises to meet us in our hope. God, we love you. We thank you for every promise fulfilled through Jesus. We thank you for every promise that is still to be fulfilled knowing that you will fulfill it. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
in his mother's arms A song on the horizon ringing through the heavens A long-awaited Savior come to set the captives free Come to set the captives free Come set us free. Sing hope has a name.
Well, hey, we've had a fantastic day today. Hope you've enjoyed today. Hope you found it helpful and hopeful and challenging and encouraging. Uh, Today, I want to let you know just a few things that you could do and a few next steps that you could take in connecting with our church beyond this hour-long experience. We just want to let you know a few things that you could, a few next steps that you could take. First of all, we want to let you know the ways that you could give, whether it's for our Home for Christmas offering towards a future permanent home for our church, or whether it's your regular giving and, and tithes and offering. We want to just let you know the ways that you can give. They're on screen right now, whether it's online, whether it's through Cash App, whether it's a text, or whether it's by sending a physical offering to our P.O. Box. We just want to say thank you so much for your generosity, for your faithfulness, for your obedience to God, uh, for your belief in our church and its vision. We offer, we, we really do believe this, that vision moves at the speed of generosity. And so vision, what we hope to do as a church, both here and now and in the future, moves at the speed of your generosity and your faithfulness and your obedience to God. So thank you so much for believing in our church and our mission and vision to create a church that unchurched people love to attend because it helps people take a first step and a next step in a growing relationship with Jesus. So we'd love for you to to, love to encourage you to take that step of generosity in this Christmas season. Then uh, we also want to let you know if you have a need that we could meet, that we could pray for you, that we could be a part of meeting that need, we would love to hear from you right now. So whether it's by email, by Facebook, by phone, we would love to hear from you so that we know how we can pray for you first of all, but also more importantly, how we could be a part of meeting your need if there's a way that we could be a part of meeting your need. And then the final thing we wanted to let you know is our kids' experiences go live every Sunday at 10 a.m. on both Facebook and, and YouTube. So if you've got kids in preschool or in elementary school, we just wanna encourage you to check those out. They're a great way to keep your kid engaged and growing in their faith, and especially during this Christmas season, to inspire some awe and wonder in them about Jesus and his arrival and what he came to do. So that's all we've got for you today. Thanks so much for joining us today for week two of Fulfilled. We'll look forward to seeing you next week for part three. And until then, keep being the movement.